All right, we have a few announcements to go over. First of all, I will be leaving uh, tomorrow afternoon, flying, going up to the airport around noon and flying out around 3.30 tomorrow to go to Kiev. I'd appreciate your prayers not only for travel, but for health, that I don't pick up a cold or flu or any of those other things that go around, as well as uh, the flight back. K KLM changed their schedule this year, and in the past I've left at 6 in the morning, which is miserable enough. But now they don't have that 6 a.m. flight, so you don't get the 10.30 nonstop out of Amsterdam. And you have to leave at 1.30 in the afternoon on Friday and get back here at 11.30 p.m. And with a one-hour connection coming through uh, Atlanta along with customs. So I'm not excited about that. I'm not anticipating that I'm going to make everything. So pray that God will go before me and all that will work out. Um, Albert will be, uh, Elbert White will be covering on Sunday mornings. Then on the next two Tuesday nights, John Williamson will begin a study of Jonah. I've been working with him on that, so we're going to uh, help him learn how to do a verse-by-verse -verse book study, and I have great confidence that he'll do a good job. And then on Thursday nights, this Thursday night, each Thursday night, we're going to live stream three different uh, sessions from pre-trib. And those, because of copyright issues, we can't post those sessions on the DBM website. So if you want to watch those, you need to email staff at deanbibleministries.org to get the password. And then you can go to the uh, link and be able to watch the video. But we just can't leave it open without a password, so you just have to email in to get the password. The other thing is, since we're having church here, we're having Bible class here, even though I'm not here, it's good for people to be here and to have some presence here because you, we have visitors that show up on Tuesday and Thursday nights, and if they show up here and nobody's here, that doesn't create a good first impression. So it's always a good idea for you to continue to be here, uh, even though uh, it's uh, uh, even though I'm not here, and even though it's a video you could watch at home, it's uh, important for people to uh, be present. So that will cover the next uh, couple of weeks, and then I will be back on the 27th on Sunday, the 27th, uh, in the pulpit to continue our study in Ephesians. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, we'll have a few moments of silent prayer so that we can make sure that we are experientially sanctified, set apart for study of God's Word, walking by the Spirit and not by the sin nature. And then after a few moments of silent prayer, when you have the opportunity to confess sin if necessary, then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we're thankful we have this time together to come and study your word, to reflect upon what you have revealed to us, what you have preserved down through the centuries, that we might be able to study these things, to learn about you, to learn about your grace and your goodness, to learn what it means to worship you. Father, we pray that as we continue our study in 2 Samuel tonight, that you'll help us to understand uh, the significance of these things and what they do teach us about you. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, tonight we're back in 2 Samuel. We have been uh, on a topical study from within the framework of 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 6. We started to develop the what the Bible teaches about worship. 
And that took us from lesson 127 through 158, so that's 31 hours of, of study on worship. So tonight we're back in lesson 159, picking up where we left off in lesson 126. So open your Bibles with me to two passages. The first passage is in 2 Samuel chapter 6, and the second passage is in 1 Chronicles chapter uh, 13. And if you have those two passages, then we'll go back and forth between them. They are parallel passages because the, the, books of, the book of Chronicles, most of these were, when you have a 1 and 2 Samuel or 1 and 2 Kings, uh, they're divided because they wouldn't all fit on one scroll. So they were originally intended to be uh, one, one book. So when you're looking at these, First and Second Samuel was written before the Babylonian captivity. It was probably written very early. Parts of it were probably written before David, and it was uh, finished, of course, probably during the reign of, of Solomon. When you get to Chronicles, Chronicles covers the same period, but it doesn't deal with what's going on uh, apart from the house of David. It really focuses on God's, uh, the way God worked in the life of David. And because it's written after the exile, it's written after the Babylonian captivity, we don't know exactly when it was written, probably sometime in the uh, late 500s or early, 600, uh, early 400s, in order to uh, remind the Jews who they were and what God's plan for them was in terms of the Abrahamic covenant, which is how First Chronicles will start off, and then tracing the lineage down through Moses and then down to David. And then the lion's share of First Chronicles focuses on the life of David, but it's different. It picks different things to emphasize than what you find in, in uh, 2 Samuel. For example, in our study, when we look at, at 2 Samuel chapter 6, it, it's covered in 23 verses. But that same episode is covered in uh, basically chapters... Uh, 14, 15, uh, mostly 15, 16, and uh, at least two or three chapters there in Second Chronicles, giving us a lot of other details. So we'll be going back and forth, and that's to see how those things fit together. There was a book that came out, a harmony of, chronic, of uh, Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles, that originally was published in 1897 by William Crockett, and has been in print ever since. It's available electronically in Lagos, maybe in some of the other uh, pro, uh, programs as well because it's in public domain. But it's uh, a good thing to read if you're uh, reading through the Bible and you want to read through these things chronologically as you see them con come together, you have parallels. And it's inter interesting then because you can see passages that are only in Samuel and passages that are only in Chronicles or passages only in Kings and only in Chronicles. So it gives you a, a, a way of looking through that. And so that's a, a good thing to look at. To remind us of what we're doing, we're in the middle of 2 Samuel chapter 6. And tonight we're going to look at the last half of 2 Samuel 6, we studied up to the point that uh, David had attempted to bring the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. There was this episode where the oxen stumble and Uzzah, who is in the, he's a Levitical priest, but he reaches out to prevent the Ark from fa uh, falling off of this cart they put it on. And because he's touched the ark, he is instantly killed. And a lot of people don't understand a lot of what's going on there. It shocked David. We did a lesson in the previous lesson in uh, 126 
on the fear of the Lord. It struck David with the fear of the Lord, realizing how serious this was. And so the ark was then sto stored in the home of a man named Obed-Edom, who is referred to as a Gittite, which means he is from Gath, where same place that Goliath is from. But what's interesting is he's listed several times in the list of the Levitical uh, singers and uh, officials that oversaw the worship in uh, the worship surrounding the ark following this episode. So uh, we're not sure a lot of things about Obed Edom, but he is uh, uh, he becomes a significant person, and God blesses his house because the ark is there. We'll get into those those particular details. But I wanted to take more time looking at these chapters in a little bit of First Chronicles 13, 14, and 15 because of the extra detail that is provided for us and because it's probably been a while uh, since you have spent much time going through these chapters in First Chronicles. So just to remind us of what's happening in 2 Samuel, I pointed out that there's basically three divisions to 2 Samuel. The first is the first, not really the first 10 chapters. Uh, chapter 1 really deals more with what's going on at the end of 1 Samuel. But 2 Samuel 2 through 10, God blesses David, and David unites and expands the kingdom. Then we see in the next section chapters 11 to 20, that God will discipline David for his sins, and David reaps the consequences. But then God, because David turns back to God, uh, God transforms the cursing into blessing. And what's important to understand here, and I'm still working through a lot of these issues, Crockett in his harmony puts all of the wars with the Philistines, the Ammonites, the Moabites, everybody else, uh, into the time period before the episode of 2 Samuel 6 and 2 Samuel 7. He puts that chronologically near the end of David's reign. There's a number of others who do that well as well, and it's not due to any liberal bias or anything like that. Uh, basically, it's because at the beginning of 2 Samuel chapter 7, when God is going to give David the, the covenant with David, it says that when David had uh, found rest from all his enemies, well, those battles aren't covered in 2 Samuel or in 1 Chronicles until after the giving of the covenant. But he doesn't get that rest from all of his enemies until until the um, uh, until the end of his reign. So there's we'll get into that more when I get back and into those uh, those details. But it seems that these events are more thematically organized than they are chronologically organized. Now that's something that that is difficult for us as descendants of Western <coughs> Europeans. Everything has to be seen in order. But you know better than that. How many times do you turn on some movie or some TV show and it starts off with a scene and then it says it stops the action at a, at a crucial uh, point and you see something on the screen that says, now, 48 hours earlier or a week earlier or something like that. And so it changes your temporal reference. Well, it's that kind of a thing that's going on here. The writer is focusing on talking about getting us to understand certain things about God's grace and about what he has done for David and despite uh, David's sins. So we'll be looking at that in more detail as we go forward. The third division has to do with six different events that are described in 2 Samuel 21 through 24 that give evidence of the significance and the greatness of God's covenant with David. In <clears throat> the section we're looking at, we see the beginning of David's kingdom in chapters 2, 3, and 4. Then God gives David control over Jerusalem. We studied that in chapter 5. And now God is being enthroned in Jerusalem 
as because the scriptures several times talk about God's throne being above the cherubim, the cherubs that are on the Ark of the Covenant. And so God is enthroned in Jerusalem. And this is where we run into uh, problems. As we got into 2 Samuel 6, 1, David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000, and he went with all the people who were with him to Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark, which is called by the name Hashem, uh, the very name of Yahweh Tzabaoth, that means Lord of the Armies, who is enthroned above the cherubim. That's the NASB 95 uh, translation. Now, think about that. That just simply summarized David has 30,000 men. He's going to go to uh, Baal Judah, and he's going to get the ark and bring it back to Jerusalem. We're told a lot more about this when we get into uh, First Chronicles, which is why I wanted to do that. Now, here is a... Uh, just a map of the central part of Israel. This is where Jebus is located. It was the Jebusites that David defeated. It, the, it was that's the an ancient name, the Canaanite name for for Jerusalem. And from there to Kiriath Jerim is about 15 miles. For those of you who've been uh, been to Israel or been with me to Israel, and I know that other tour groups do this as well. There's a couple of really nice, decent Arab restaurants in a place called Abu Ghosh. And Abu Ghosh has, is basically the Arab village that's right there by uh, Kiryath Jerim. And so that's just, uh, you know, it takes you about 20 minutes from, from the hotel in Jerusalem to get there. And then we have our last meal before we go uh, to, uh, to the airport. So this gives you a little bit of a frame of reference. Now, let me give you a little bit of an overview on, on uh, Chronicles. Uh, First Chronicles and Second Chronicles are really designed to teach the people about the glories of God's grace in the Davidic dynasty, why David is so important, and to encourage them to finish building the temple. That's why there's so much in First Chronicles about the Ark of the Covenant and about, uh, about the temple. So the first nine chapters of those chapters, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but these are the chapters that I know you. You skip those when you're reading through your Bible every year because they're genealogies, and it starts with Abraham and goes all the way to, uh, to David, and it lists all the priests and all the descendants of of the different uh, sons of Aaron and, and everything, and most people start getting uh, glazed eyes and crossed eyes because they don't know who any of those people are, and they don't understand why that's there. It's there to trace the lineage. There's a promise of the seed of the woman that will defeat the seed of the serpent in Genesis 3.15, and the genealogies trace the lineage from Adam to Noah in Genesis chapter 5, and then when you get into Genesis 10, what's, what happens to the sons of Noah? And so you have the genealogy of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and then Genesis 11, it focuses more on the genealogy of Ham, specifically that line that ends up uh, building the Tower of, of Babel. And then out of that line, because Abraham's family came from Ur of the Chaldees, which is south of where Babylon was, or the plain of Shinar, then you see God beginning to hone in on the seed that he's going to call out Abraham, and it's through the seed of Abraham that the promise will come. And so it's traced from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, and then you have uh, the other tribes of, of, uh, of Jacob or Israel as he is renamed by God. And then you have that lineage, and you have the Levitical lineage, that is traced down from one of the sons, Levi, who's the progenitor of the tribe of priests. And in his line, you have Moses and Aaron. They are both from the tribe of, of Levi. And then it's traced further down, and you end up taking it all the way down to uh, the high priest, Eli, at the time of Samuel. We studied about him at the first part uh, of, of 1 Samuel. 
So there's this, the tracing of the line so we know that David is in the line of Judah. God had promised and prophesied that the Messiah would come, the king, the future king would come through uh, uh, Judah, one of the uh, 12 tribes. And so those first nine chapters trace that for us. Why is it, and, and basically it's the preface that's answering the question, why are we going to spend from chapter 935 to 2930, basically 20 chapters, why are we going to spend 20 chapters talking about David? And so that's why, is because he's in that line of Judah, the line of the, of the future king. Now when we look at that, uh, the major section, 935 to 2930, focuses on David. It's all about David. And there are seven sections that can be subdivided here. Uh, the first is that God elevates David to be king of Israel. And it's really short. We went through a lot related to the end of Saul, the end of Saul's dynasty, the uh, God anointing David in, by Samuel in 1 Samuel 7, uh, 16. And we go through that, and it summarizes all of that in about 12 or 15 verses. Then the second thing is that we see God fulfilling his promise to make David the king of Israel. And this is described in chapter 11, verses 1 through 20. Now, in the first section, it's going to bring to a close that section 935 to 1014. It ends with uh, the death of Saul, and the purpose of that section is to something very important in light of what happens in both of these, the organization in both books. You have, uh, you, you have God telling them that, telling the story of the end of Saul's dynasty. And then he's going to bring David forward. And it looks like Saul's dynasty is ended. You're going to, we're going to get into some more things with the um, you know, the shenanigans that are going on behind the scenes with Saul's family and trying to regain the throne. We've seen a little bit of it so far. But basically, there is still the possibility that one of Saul's descendants is going to get on the throne. Why is that? Because David is still married to Michal, who is Saul's daughter. And that's one of the many things that comes out in this episode, because the last line in uh, 2 Samuel 6 is that, that uh, he, because uh, she despises him, David puts her away, and she never has any children. That sets the stage for David having children, and it's through his line, not Saul's line, that the seed of the woman, the seed, the descendant of Judah will come. So it all uh, connects to, to uh, all connects together. So uh, God is now going to fulfill His promise to make David the king of Israel, and this is summarized very, very briefly. There's a, a lot more to it. There's about five chapters to it in uh, in Second Samuel. But this is just a brief summary, and it doesn't even mention the seven years that he's king in Hebron. It just starts off with all the uh, heads of all the tribes come to Hebron to make him king over all of Israel. And so then he is anointed king of Israel and unites the tribes. So that's pretty much what happens in, um, in chapter 11 and the first part of chapter 12. And then the third section is the second longest section in Chronicles. It's about how God allows David to bring the ark back to Jerusalem. Notice it goes from 13 through 16. So you have four chapters just on David bringing the ark into Jerusalem, as opposed to one chapter in 2 Samuel. Now, what do you think that's all about? That's really important. Now, remember what I told you the purpose for Chronicles is? It's to motivate the people in rebuilding the temple and why it's important to rebuild the temple and how that's related to the Davidic covenant. So when you read through 1 Chronicles, you're going to have four chapters here that talk about the movement of the ark to Jerusalem. And then there's going to be a shift in, in uh, action 
And then um, later in the book, the longest section in, in the book is all about what God revealed to David about building the, the temple. That's the longest section in the book. That comes up in chapters 21 to 29. So that gives us nine chapters related to that. So four chapters here related to the ark, then nine chapters related to the temple. Do you get the point that it's all about the worship of God and uh, re restoring temple worship after the exile? Chapter 17, God makes a covenant with David, comparable to 2 Samuel chapter 7. And then uh, the next part, the fifth part, is God gives David victory over his enemy. So it's following the same literary order, but again, it's not chronological. And I've been looking at and reading through material on this, and my eyes were starting to glaze over as I was trying to make sense of this. And not everyone agrees on this. So now I've got to try to figure out what the arguments are for each of these different positions. So God will give David victory over his enemies in these three chapters, 18.1, are just short of three chapters, to 20, verse 8. And then in the sixth part, God reveals to David his plans for the temple and temple worship. So when David is organizing the, the, the choirs and the orchestra and the music and the, and the musical guilds and the training sessions and all of this, this isn't something that David is developing on his own. In this chapter, again and again, he refers to the fact that God revealed this to him in order to tell Solomon. So David structures these things and he structures the worship of, of Israel on the basis of divine revelation. The only thing that is disappointing to him is that God is not going to allow David to uh, build the temple. We'll get into that when we get into chapter 7. Then the last part of chapter 29 recounts the death of, of David. So that gives us most of what goes on in Second, and um, I mean in First First Chronicles. There, I couldn't get the slide to advance. There we go. So, what we see in the we drill down in this central section from thirteen through fifteen, based on a three part analysis of Kevin Zuber in the Moody Bible Commentary. He said he analyzes it this way: that first David moves the ark. That's part one, and runs into a problem because of the death of Uzzah. And then in 14, 1 through 17, we have the episode of David defeating the Philistines. Now this is where it gets confusing because if you're reading through this and you're thinking about the chronology, it's three months that the ark is at the home of, of Obed-Edom. It's the whole episode of David defeating the Philistines taking place within that three month period. It doesn't work out that way. So the writer is choosing to put that there for a reason. Then we're going to get to uh, the th uh, third part is David moves the ark the second time. This time he gets it right, and that's in chapters 15 and 16. So basically what the writer is doing is he's, he's glorifying David. He's glorifying the house of David. He's, he, it's it's um, uh, all about Israel coming back together and uh, recovering the, the plan of God for Israel as stated in the Abrahamic covenant and then the Davidic covenant. <coughs> <coughs> so when we come to David... Uh, when we come to David bringing the ark in, we're going to review that here. David brings the ark in the first time, and we read in 1 Chronicles 13.8, and it's pretty close to what we find in uh, 2 Samuel 6. Then David and all Israel played music before God with all their might, with singing on harps, on stringed instruments, on tambourines, on cymbals, and with trumpets. So you see uh, singing, you see an orchestra there. But what you don't see, if you're careful, 
is that the organization of the singers and the musicians and their training and their structure doesn't happen until chapter 15. It doesn't happen until David gets slapped down for not doing it right. So this gives us a picture that when he starts to bring the ark in, he understands there should be a certain amount of pomp and circumstance, and he is, they're going to come together and they're going to sing and there's going to be music, but he doesn't get it right. Nothing that they're doing is really right. It isn't thought through biblically. So he's doing a right thing, but a wrong way, which is sort of what I've been trying to teach about worship, is that if you look at the modern, modern views on worship, they're trying to do a right thing, which is to worship God, but they're doing it a wrong way. They're not thinking very deeply or profoundly about music or about song or about all of the other components of a worship service so that everything is done in a way that brings honor honor and glory to God. What happened with with David is that they just they they got together to bring the ark into into Jerusalem and they built a new cart an, and that is drawn by a team of oxen, and they are there. It's surrounded by some priests because Uzzah is a priest, but it's not done exactly the way God said to do it. And we see the instructions given in um, in the book of Numbers and in the book of Exodus when they traveled. Numbers 4, uh, 5, and 6 says, When the camp sets out, Aaron and his sons shall go in, that is, into the uh, temple, the Mishkan, the, the holy place. They go into the holy place, and they take down the veil of the screen, and then as they take the veil down, they walk forward and put the veil over the ark. So they're not looking at the ark. So they go in, and they cover the ark, and then they put the covering of the porpoise skin, which is part of the covering of the, of the mishkan, part of the roof, and they put that over it, and then the other cloth that's part of the roof, and this covers the ark. So it was not something that people could gaze at and look at. It was kept, uh, kept covered. Furthermore, there were rings on the four corners of the ark, and poles were to be inserted into those rings and were not supposed to be removed so that it would be carried by those poles. The only ones that were authorized to carry it by the poles were the Levites. Deuteronomy 10, 8, and number 7, 9. At that time, the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi to carry the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. So only Levites could carry it. Um, and number seven nine tells us that they were to carry it on their shoulders. So th there is a proper procedure. They don't just pick it up and carry it low, but they pick it up and they hoist it up on their shoulders so that God is high and everyone can see where the ark is, even though it's covered, they can see where the ark is, that God is leading them, uh, God is leading them forward. So in 1 Samuel 7, 1, we learn that uh, after the travels, the ark's captured uh, earlier and taken to the, uh, taken to the Philistine uh, city where it's put before the, uh, the idol of Dagon and eventually goes around to the different, uh, uh, different cities of Gaza and Gath and uh, some of the others, and the people don't want it because there's disease and other things that are accompanying it. And so they, it's taken to uh, kiriath Jerim, and uh, it's left. I mean, they had put it on a, the, the Philistines had put it on a cart that was drawn by, by oxen. That's not how it's described to be carried. That's how the pagans treated God. So this ark comes, the men of Kiriath-Jerim see it, they, 
uh, take it. They take it off of the cart. They use the cart for wood to have a sacrifice to kill the oxen and have, a, have an offering there. Uh, but then they all start looking into the ark, and so they're struck dead because of the lack of respect for God. So it eventually is taken into the house of Abinadab uh, on the hill, and uh, his son uh, Eliezer, their priest, their Levites, his son Eliezer is uh, given the responsibility. He is consecrated or sanctified to keep the ark of the Lord. And so now you have uh, Levites watching over it. And so at this time, David is going to go and retrieve uh, this ark from kiriath Jerim. And in 1 Chronicles 13, 3, we read him saying, uh, Let us bring the ark of our God back to us, for we have not inquired of, at it since the days of Saul. So that tells us that there has been a long time when God has been, uh, God has been ignored. Now, what's interesting when you look at, for, at 2 Samuel chapter six, and you look at the at um, uh, First Chronicles chapter thirteen, the one phrase stands out that's used again and again, and it has to do with the ark. In Second Samuel six, the phrase "ark of God." or Ark of the Lord, or simply Ark one time. It's mentioned 15 times in those 23 verses in, in uh, 2 Samuel 6. In 1 Chronicles 13, it's mentioned eight times. You have the phrase, the Ark of our God, the Ark of God, the Ark of God, the Lord, and then one time simply the Ark. What that tells you when you have a chapter where you have any phrase or name or something like that mentioned so many times is that's the focal point of the chapter. So it's very important to understand what God is saying about the ark. This is his dwelling place, and it has to be handled precisely. That if you don't, it, it, God dealt with them in grace. They, they followed pagan practices. This is so often what happens. It's, it's happened every century down through the church age where Christians adopt pagan practices to worship God. And it's always a failure. It always leads to a lot of problems. And that's what the Jews did. We're going to bring the ark. The first time David's bringing the ark up, we're going to do it like the pagans did it. We, get a, we build a new cart. We put a couple of oxen on it. And we're going to transport the ark according to the way the Philistines did it, not according to the way God revealed uh, to Moses. And that creates, creates a problem. So um, the ark is brought up. First Chronicles 13, 4, Then all the assembly said that they would do so, for the thing was right in all the eyes of the people. They haven't really inquired of the Lord yet. Okay, it is, they're doing the right thing, but the wrong way. They're, they're like a lot of Christians. They give lip service to the Bible. They give lip service to uh, going to church. They may be actively involved in church, but they haven't submitted to the authority of the Scripture and to the authority of God. Every one of us has a basic problem in our life. Are we going to submit to the authority of the Scripture, which is the authority of God, or are we going to submit to the authority of our sin nature? I mean, you know, many times I've talked about empiricism and rationalism and mysticism, but what lies behind all those three independent ways of coming to knowledge is just the sin nature. And that's always the issue, and it's true for every single person here, it's true for me, it's true for every Christian. It's a daily battle, it's an hourly battle, it's a minute-by-minute -minute battle. Are you going to submit to the authority of Scripture, are you going to submit to the authority of your sin nature? And there are way too many Christians who spend the whole time dressing up their sin nature uh, by like putting lipstick on a pig to try to make it look good. And it doesn't. Uh, you can put lipstick on the carcass of a dead, rotting pig, and it still doesn't make it attractive, but that's basically what your sin nature is. So that's what they've done. They're trying to do a right thing the wrong way, according to their own sin nature and their own way of doing things. And so, 
Then in uh, 13.5, we read, So David gathered all Israel together from Shihor in Egypt to as far as the entrance of Hamath to bring the ark of God from kiriath Jerim. So he wants a big crowd. He's trying to get everybody there. He understands the centrality of the ark and its importance to the worship of the nation and the unity of the nation. And so he gathers everybody together. And David and all Israel go up to Baalah, to kiriath Jerim, which belonged to Judah, to bring up from there the ark of the Lord who dwells between the cherubim where his name is proclaimed. This is the same thing that's summarized in 2 Samuel 6.3. Uh, they set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. This is the problem. A new cart is what man has built. When you're carrying the ark on the shoulders of the priests who have been sanctified by God, you're doing it God's way. So you're either doing it by man's way and the uh, man's efforts and man's works, or you're doing it God, uh, God's way. And so after the uh, oxen stumbles, then Uzzah tries to stabilize God. You don't need to stabilize God, but the whole situation's been wrong. But God didn't lower the boom when they used a, a cart instead of uh, carrying it on their shoulders. He's not lowering the boom because they haven't covered the ark. He, he's, he's allowed a lot of wiggle room in terms of their disobedience. But when it gets to the point where somebody is touching the ark, that's it. It's time for divine discipline. And that's why Uzzah dies at that particular point. And God struck him there for his error, and he died there by the ark of God. And then David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah, called the place Perez Uzzah, or the outbreak of God against Uzzah to this day. So... The ark then goes to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all of his household. Second, I mean, 1 Chronicles 13.13 13 says basically the same thing, that David would not move the ark with him into the city of David, but took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. What David has learned here is there are right and wrong ways to worship God. We have to do what God says to do. Now, in the New Testament, there aren't as strict guidelines on worship as there are in the Old Testament. And as I pointed out in our conclusion to the worship series last week, it doesn't mean that we're free to just do whatever we want to do uh, on the basis of whatever creativity we have to uh, do something and claim that it is it, it honors God and it's the worship of God. It has to be consistent with all of this teaching from the Old Testament. That doesn't mean we do it exactly the same way, but that that sets certain standards and it sets certain principles that are in place uh, and that, God, you, that the worshiper needs to be sanctified before coming into the presence of God, that there needs to be a sacrifice in the church age. The sacrifice has been completed. It's Christ's work on the cross on, uh, on Golgotha that the people come together for the proclamation of God's word, which is at the centerpiece of our, of our worship, and that we obey him, that it involves praise, it involves thanksgiving, and there are patterns of praise and thanksgiving to us in the 150 psalms that are recorded in the scripture to give us an idea of what, uh, what the music or the words at least, should be like and how it should develop thought and thinking. So David learned something fundamental here that he can't impose his ideas, his opinions, his values on the worship of God. Um, we also see as an important principle that God is more interested in blessing than judgment. When the ark is moved to the house of Obed-Edom, God blesses the house of Obed-Edom, and it's emphasized he's a Gittite. And so he could have been a Levite who grew up in Gath, because later he is a part of the, the, the uh, Levitical priests, the team that's surrounding the ark, and so that sounds very much like he's a, he's a Levite. But God is going to bless him 
the harsh judgment against Uzzah is not something that primarily characterizes God. God's not out there trying to uh, hammer everybody who does something wrong. He's not pictured here as a God who is primarily interested in judgment. He's a God who's primarily interested in grace and blessing, but he's only going to be gracious so far. When the righteousness of God is violated, eventually the justice of God has to apply the righteous standard of God uh, to the situation. So God is slow to anger, and he's quick to forgive, but he is not going to be permissive, as it were. Now, at this point, we switch back. I want to switch back and forth a little bit, and we'll look at 2 Samuel uh, chapter 6, verses 12 to 13. And this is the parallel. And in those verses we read, it was told King David saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. Notice how, how quickly there's a summary there. It doesn't go into all the details that we get in 1 Chronicles 14 and 15. It's just a quick summary. What David sees is that the ark is not something to be afraid of, but that God is a God who has richly blessed Obed-Edom, and God will still bless Israel, but he has to be obeyed. And so that causes David to go back to look at the law and determine exactly how the ark was supposed to be be carried. And this is then summarized in verse 13. So it was when those bearing the ark of the Lord, notice it's people carrying, it's the Levites carrying the ark now. Those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. So there's a constant sacrifice to God along the way. In 1 Chronicles 15, 3, we read, and David gathered all Israel together at Jerusalem. Now, this is a separate gathering than the one that had occurred three months earlier. And it's all of Israel. But notice what happens as we get into chapter, chapter 15. There is something significantly different. And that is the detail that we're given about uh, the organization and the training that goes in for those who are involved with the worship of the ark. In verse uh, 3, gathered all Israel together at Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord to its place which he had prepared for it. And then if you look at verses 4 through 10, it's another one of those sections you're tempted to skip over. And David assembles the children of Aaron and the Levites. So what he's doing is he's bringing all of the clans together, and it lists them all uh, according to their, their clan, and he's going to organize them. So now the worship of God is going to be structured. Uh, Paul says this in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 14, that God is not a God of disorder. He is a God of structure. Just look at creation. It's deeply structured and profoundly organized. And so all of the Levites are brought together in terms of their clans. And in verse 12, he says, You're the heads of the fathers' houses of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves. Before you're going to serve, you have to be sanctified. Again and again, we see this same principle of being uh, ritually cleansed and sanctified in order to serve the Lord. Uh, and in verse 13, um, he says, For because you did not do it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us, because we did not consult him about the proper order. So the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel, and the children of the Levites bore the ark of God on their shoulders by its poles, as Moses had commanded, according to the word of the Lord. And so then when we get to verse, uh, verse 16... I had those on slides. We get to verse 16. David then spoke to the leaders of the Levites to appoint their brethren to be the singers accompanied by instruments of music 
stringed instruments, harps, and cymbals by raising the voice with resounding joy. So at this point, what he's doing is he's going to organize the, uh, the choirs and the orchestras. And it's interesting what happens in this section in terms of the, uh, in terms of the words that are used. Uh, they organize themselves, so they're going to appoint their brethren, some to be singers, some, some to play the instruments, and they're, they're organized, and they're going to be trained. Uh, this is another key point that is uh, brought out here. <coughs> As he does this, he picks, and you notice these names, Heman and Asaph, um, and Ethan, the son of Keshia, these names show up on a few of the Psalms. So, you know, these were some of the greatest musicians that Israel had at the time of David. And they become the heads of these clans of musicians and these schools of training. One of the things that we see as we look at the language that's, that's used here in, uh, in, in some of the words is that, that it emphasizes uh, intense training and, and discipline and organization. That's, that's what the terms mean. So it's, um, what we see here is that David is functioning now as a second Moses. And the Davidic dynasty is understood now to be the patron, the one that oversees the worship of God in the, in the temple. And that means more than simply maintaining the, um, the, the forms and ceremonies at an external level, but to bring it down to where the people are responding from their, from their soul to what God has done for them. So it's not just a matter of sort of a formalism. Then we get down to verse... Um, let me see if we have it here. Uh, verse, let me look at the parallel in 2 Samuel 6. What happens when they bring the ark in, then David dances before the Lord with all his might. Now, when we read that, what vision do you have in your head? You know, depending on your background, you're going to picture that dancing a lot of different ways. But in 2 Samuel, we don't have the structure, the context around it that we have in Chronicles. In Chronicles, we see all of this organization. We see the stratification of the leadership. We see teachers. We see these various schools that are developed. It's highly structured. This is not then speaking about David giving some sort of impromptu uh, unstructured dance. He's not just jumping around in front of the ark. That doesn't fit with anything that's going on in this scenario, which is very well regulated and very well structured and organized, so that there are, there are a lot of ways that David could dance. It talks about he dances with all his might. That doesn't mean he's just throwing a lot of energy into it. It has to do with his, his, uh, his purpose, his intent, his uh, understanding, and his pre-planning for exactly what he is going to do, and maybe even involving rehearsal of how he is going to dance. You can think of a lot of different ways that we express dance in the history uh, of our culture. You can think of some uh, incredible ballets. You can think of the dance of other, uh, of other people that is structured and formed. It takes a lot of dif discipline and a lot of effort to make it look good. The other night I was awake early or late in the night, early in the morning, whatever three o'clock is, and I was channel surfing and ran across a, a film with uh, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. And just watching them move, you know this is not something they just said, oh, let's go do this. 
there were hours and hours and hours of rehearsal getting every movement right and and doing it at the right time perfectly in time with the music and facing the camera in the correct direction and all of the other things that were involved in that and so when we read this quick summary don't get the idea that this is just some spontaneous emotional response of david it doesn't fit the structure of all of the uh, organization that is going on here. We look back at 1 Chronicles 15 and verse 25 we read, So David, the elders of Israel, and the captains over thousands. So everything is broken down into thousands and hundreds. And so these are your, what we would call field grade officers, your upper level officers. And they are the ones who are closest to and surrounding uh, the Ark of the Covenant, as David brings it up from the house of Obed-Edom. And then we read in verse 26, And so it was when God helped the Levites. Now there's that word, Eitzer, that we've studied before. It's only used of God, or primarily used of God, in the Scripture. God is an Eitzer to people. This is not a lowly uh, subservient position that you should look down upon. The reason I say that is because in Genesis chapter 2, God says that the woman was created to be an Eitzer for the man. And the modern feminist movement since the 19th century see the Bible and Christianity and Judaism are degrading to women because she just has this subordinate role. Well, you've made a theological statement that is blasphemous there. Because if you're defining the role of an Eitzer as someone who is of, of second-rate importance, then that's what you're saying about God. It's a pretty significant thing for somebody to be called an Eitzer. That's what God is. So that's a very godly role. So this is what we see here. God is strengthening and helping the Levites who bore the Ark of the Covenant. And um, they offered seven bulls and seven rams. And then we see a description of David. He's clothed with a robe of fine linen. We learn in Samuel it's a linen ephod. As were all the Levites who bore the ark, so there's some who are carrying the ark. There are the singers, and then Hananiah, who's the music master with the singers. So he is exceptionally well-trained and, uh, and talented, and he is over, um, he is over the singers. And then we get to, uh, at the end of the episode in First Chronicles 16, 7, David is going to uh, bring a psalm. And when he brings this psalm in First uh, Chronicles 16, 7, it is actually composed of parts of uh, several other psalms, Psalm 105, Psalm 106, and, uh, and another one. And that brings... Uh, you know, and it's very highly, uh, very highly structured. Now back, uh, kind of jumped ahead there, back to First Chronicles 16, 2. When David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. Now we studied the offerings when we were going through worship. The first thing that would happen is that you would bring a sin offering trespass or what might be referred to or what I refer to as a reparation offering. This is a cleansing offering. Uh, that's the first offering. Now you've been cleansed of sin. The second thing that you would offer, the second offering you would give is a whole burnt offering. You'd bring a bullock or you'd bring a, a sheep or goat. If you were poor, you brought a, a, a bird. But if you are bringing a bull, this is very expensive and everything is burned up. And the smoke goes to God. It's called an ola, uh, which in Hebrew means to go up. Everything ascends to God. And it is a picture that after you've confessed sin and been cleansed, now you're making a statement that you are giving everything in your life to God. Everything is committed to Him. And after that, then you bring the peace offering. And in the peace offering, this was the only offering where it was also called a fellowship offering because there's now fellowship between you and God that when you bring the meal and you, uh, the grain and you have the fellowship offering and you take um, 
and you have another offering where the meat is cooked, now you're going to have a meal. And so all of the food is then passed out to those who are there. It's given to the priests. It's given to the crowd that's there. And this is one reason you didn't have a lot of beggars in Jerusalem. Uh, the poor would be taken care of by the food that was uh, left over from these, these peace offerings. In 2 Samuel we read, So they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle, that is the tent, that David had erected for it. Then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. When he finished, then it pretty much repeats what's in First uh, Chronicles. But it gives the result. Afterward, he does what I just talked about. He's given the peace offering, and so now he shares from the bounty of the food. He distributed among all the people, among the whole multitude of Israel, both the women and the men, to everyone a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, a cake of raisins. So all the people departed, everyone to his house. First Chronicles 16.3 uh, repeats that. And so then he's going to organize talks about this organization of the Levites. He appointed some to minister, that is, they served before the ark of the Lord, to commemorate, which means to remember. These three phrases are used here, commemorate, to thank, and to praise. Those represent three types of psalms, those that are remembering what God has done in the past in terms of, a, of, of, of descriptive praise, and then... Uh, to thank God in terms of thank offerings and to praise Him, declarative praises. And then there are those who have specific roles, like Benaiah and Jehaziel. They uh, regularly blew trumpets before the ark of the Lord. And so as we look at this, we see all of these different aspects that are developed and the training that is involved in uh, in the musicians, that these were uh, schools of musicians, and one of the terms that's used to describe them is, they're, they're, it's translated as instructors, but it's the idea in the Hebrew of someone who exercises rigorous discipline on students. And so it's not just musicians that can come and play whatever God has put on their heart. Uh, it's well-planned, it's rehearsed, there's training, there's discipline. I mean, this is the Juilliard School of Musicians for that generation. These were all uh, outstanding musicians because that's what would be required at the temple where God himself dwelt. Now we come to the other sort of the dark side of this is as David has danced before the Lord, we read that there's one person who's not too happy about this. And this is his wife, Michal, who is the daughter of Saul. And in 2 Samuel 6, 16, we read, as, as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. She detested him. She has absolutely no respect whatsoever for him. And so uh, she has, she, she's just going to ridicule him from this point on. And then when David, a few verses later, comes to her uh, to bless his household, she comes out and she just mocks him and she's sarcastic, and she's rude, and she's just, well, how glorious were you today? You're out there dancing around and, and doing all of that, and all, it's all for your own attention. It's not for God. And she just runs him down in front of everybody, and David turns to her and says, this was before the Lord. It was between myself and the Lord. He chose me instead of your father. In other words, you're just jealous because uh, God disciplined your father, and your dynasty has ended. And God appointed me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord. And I will be even more undignified than this and will be humble in my own sight. It's not that he was doing something that was coarse. He was doing something that didn't, in the mind of the pagan culture, didn't befit 
the role of a, of a king or a president or someone. He, he humbled himself before God, and that is why she uh, was ridicule, ridiculing him. At the end of David's psalm, in Psalm 16, uh, 34 to 36, uh, this is what we read. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. And say, save us. And the Hebrew there is hoshiana, hoshianu. What, what, how does that come over into English? Hosanna. That's what they said when G Jesus comes into Jerusalem before the crucifixion. They're singing Hosanna. It's the Hebrew hoshianu, which means save us. O God of our salvation, gather us together and deliver us from the Gentiles, to give thanks to your holy name, to triumph in your praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. And all the people said, Amen, and praise the Lord. And what happens? The epilogue. Therefore, Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. That's what ends the dynasty of Saul. There's no heir, she has no children, there's no one to follow in Saul. And that's the thematic link to going into the Davidic covenant where God is going to promise an eternal dynasty, an eternal seed to David. And so when we come back next time, that's where we'll start, where God comes to David. And notice in, in 2 Samuel 7.1, now it came to pass when the king was dwelling in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies all around. That's why it looks like this is taken out of chronological order because he still has to f defeat the Philistines, the Ammonites, the Moabites, and all of the other enemies of Israel. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this time we've had to study this evening, to think our way through this, to realize how profound and detailed your word is and how detailed and structured the worship was. And that was a result not of David just coming up with these ideas on his own, but because you revealed to him the kind of order and organization that was necessary uh, to worship you in the temple. And all of this that we're reading in Chronicles leads to that worship that will be established once the temple is built. Father, we pray that we would think profoundly about our own worship, that it is structured in a way that honors and glorifies you for all of our lives are to be in worship to you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.